All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, now, once again, if you know someone who is a vegan, uh, who's a vegetarian, who feels guilty if they eat meat, I want you to please click the share button and tap their name so they get a notification because they really need to hear this discussion. Share this on your Facebook page. Share it in your keto group. Share it on your carnivore group. Share it in your vegan group because vegans really need to hear this because so many vegans eat vegan because they feel like they're helping the planet by doing that. And so we're going to be talking about that and discussing that uh, respectfully and hopefully intellectually this evening. This is Dr. Peter Ballerstadt. He is a preeminent force in this sphere, and I want him to introduce himself and tell us why we should listen to him. Go for it, Peter. Well, thank you, Ken. If for no other reason than all the effort to get here, I think you should listen to him. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, my background is I am someone who is having personal experience with restricted carbohydrate, ketogenic, and now mostly carnivorous diet. But my background academically, I'm trained in forage agronomy, ruminant nutrition. So the brief definition is I'm an agriculturalist that focuses on things like soil sciences, plant sciences, and ruminant animal sciences. So those would be beef cattle, dairy cattle, small ruminants like sheep and goats, um, and then the rest of the ruminant families uh, that exist in the world. And I found a niche where I can try to introduce my agricultural tribe to what I'm convinced is a life-saving message from the more informed, if you will, nutrition tribes that I've come in contact with, as well as introduce my nutrition tribes to some agricultural messages that they may not be aware of. And the thing I wanna help us avoid is getting invested in narratives that really aren't critical to our message. Gotcha. And so tell it, name us, name all the ruminants, Peter. What are all the ruminants <laughs> when you say that? Uh, or well, at least the most common ones. At least the most common so, ruminants so, that we would know about. Sure. Beef animals, beef cows, dairy cows, sheep, goats. Those are the ones that might be most familiar, but you could also think of animals like the American bison or the buffalo that are also domesticated in other parts of the world. Um, you could think of deer and moose and giraffe, and there's, there's about 130 different species, 20-some um, of them we've domesticated. Yes. So now, now, please, for those of us who don't have a PhD in ruminants, tell us what, just tell us what a ruminant is. What makes a ruminant a ruminant? And how does that affect their, their meat? And how does that affect them as food for us? And how does that affect the planet? Just wrap it all up and put a bow on it. And keep in mind, my sixth grade teacher, Danny McKnight, is watching. And so please try to make me look good, OK? Uh, OK. Yes, yes, doctor. <laughs> um, so so the, the, the biggest um, identifier of ruminants is that they have a multi-compartmented stomach. They also chew their cud. Um, both of these are essential for their role in utilizing the high fiber, low nutritive quality diet that they're able to exist on. So if you think of grass or Forbes brush, those sorts of feedstuffs, are very high in fiber, very low in fat, and the protein that they have is low quality when you compare it to what we need in our diet. And because these animals have this multi-compartmented stomach that hosts trillions of microorganisms, those microorganisms produce uh, byproducts. They also produce 
uh, an enzyme that no vertebrate animal, no higher life form animal produces called cellulase. And cellulase is critical for breaking down this complex carbohydrate called cellulose, which you could think of it as fiber and not be too overly simplistic. F cellulose is nothing more than glucose units hooked together, but in a different orientation than you hook them together when you make starch. And we make amylase, which is the enzyme necessary to break down starch. Obviously, we can use that. But cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate <clears throat> in the biosphere, and we can't use it directly. And if you think about grasslands, they're the majority of our farmland. They're the majority of, they're the largest biome on terrestrial earth. And the only food producing activity that we can use them for is to run ruminant animals on them to convert the grass into high quality animal protein, animal fat, either as meat or as dairy products. So ruminants have access to an enzyme, cellulase, that human beings don't have, we don't have access to that enzyme. And so that's why we can't live on grass. We could go and, and cut some grass and wilt it and just eat our fill of it until we're stuffed and we'll get no nutritional value from that. We'll just make a lot of poop and we'll, if we li tried to live on grass, we would eventually starve to death because we cannot break the bond that the cellulase is able to break in the ruminant's digestive system. And so they can use that as energy and they can make tasty steak out of it, whereas we can't use cellulase. And I, I can remember, Peter, years ago when I was an undergraduate, I'd, I'd read a little about cellulase. And I was thinking, man, if we could just somehow genetically splice the enzyme into our DNA so we could break down cellulase, I mean, so we could break down cellulose, <clears throat> you would you would solve the world hunger problem because we could all just eat grass. And that was a young undergraduate me think, thinking very primitively, right? And so ruminants right. can do this. Now, so you said something I think that's a key. So many, tri what, millions of acres of land are grassland. And so I think a lot of vegans think that we we take farmland and uh, we take like uh, tillable land and convert it to pasture to feed our cows so that then we can have ribeye. Talk to us about the, the error in that way of thinking. How is, how is grassland and tillable soil, how is that different? Can you convert one to the other easily, et cetera? Well, unfortunately, we've converted a great deal of our grassland into agricultural land, uh, or maybe put it a different way, we've taken grassland and, and tilled it to produce arable crops. So maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. Um, but the majority of farmland in the United States is in fact what we would call rangeland. It's pasture, long-term pasture. It's ground that cannot, should not be cultivated. If you do cultivate it, then think Dust Bowl. Um, yeah. the environmental pushback will occur. Um, nature votes last is one way to look at it. Um, so people will frequently say things like, look at how much land farmland is used to produce livestock. And just as you said, if we didn't do that, then think of how many people we could feed. But what they're perhaps not realizing is that there's a difference between arable farmland and rangeland, which is classed as farmland, but which should not be used for the production of commodity crops it should not be tilled, it should not be arable land. Now, as I said before, a lot of our grasslands have been converted into very productive farmlands. Think Iowa, think Indiana and Illinois, think Ohio. The, this was what was originally called tall grass prairie. That was its natural 
um, biome and human settlement and development converted that into agricultural land. I think going forward, we're likely to have some sort of hybrid system where we're going to continue to produce arable crops, but perhaps we can do a better job with grassland and learn to emphasize the ruminant animal products as we attempt to feed a growing population going toward 2050. Gotcha, gotcha, very interesting. So if we, I, I suspect we have a vegan or two watching just because I have, a, I have a few that kind of watch my page. Explain to them how if we eat beef or lamb or goat, why do they think that we're harming the planet and, and how is it that we're probably actually helping the planet by uh, eating ruminants and by condoning ruminants to, to range the grasslands and perhaps even reconverting some of the, the arable land back to grassland? How would that help the planet in your opinion? Well, I think first, for, for, there's, there's many segments to this that you know, you and I have spoken a little bit before, and, and we know that there's lots of ways you can go on this. But one of the, there, there's a number of beliefs, narratives that say, you know, environmental footprint, you can break that down into things like land use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, competition for resources, in other words, how much food it feed for an animal it takes to produce a pound of beef to be food for us. And every one of those stories in its common popular understanding is overly simplified and too often incorrectly overly simplified and gives people the impression that, well, we could just go one or the other. The truth is animal agriculture, plant agriculture are going to be integrated. They are now, they will be in the future. And then you can move forward and look at things like, it's not just the cellulase bit, right? The, there are other things that ruminant animals do. For example, they can take non-protein nitrogen or poor nitrogen poor quality protein quality feeds and somebody has said upcycle them into high quality animal protein and so if you look at a comparison between human diet ruminant diet and just look at our three macronutrients if we look at protein there are essential amino acids in the human diet and we have a very hard time getting those from plant-based diets. There is no such thing as an essential amino acid in a ruminant's diet. That's just what I said. The, the, the nitrogen containing material comes in in their diet. The microorganisms in that anaerobic fermentation process can capture the nitrogen, make microbial protein, that then gets harvested by the host animal in its acidic stomach and small intestine. So that's the fourth of the four stomachs in a, in a, a ruminant. So protein is a really expensive and scarce element out in nature. And so, so that's one aspect that people frequently don't recognize. Another is that the there is no, there, there are essential fatty acids in a human, human's diet. There's apparently no such thing as an essential fatty acid in a ruminant's diet. And then the, the third macronutrient would be carbohydrate. And people would undoubtedly be aware that there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in a human's diet. There are two forms, however, that are essential to ruminants. They have to have both what we call structural carbohydrate and non-structural carbohydrate. So structural carbohydrate would be things like fiber. 
non-structural will be things like starch and sugar. And if we don't have both of those kinds of carbohydrates present in a ruminant's diet in the proper amounts, you know, balance, <clears throat> then their rumen doesn't function properly. So you could think of ruminant animals as the peak carbohydrate-based consumers. And it's interesting that they were fully in place like 20 million years ago. All the families of ruminants that we know now were complete and in place by that time. Now, clearly things continue to develop, but then, you know, these weird, you know, sort of bipedal upright organisms evolved relatively recently. And it's, you know, that, that quote about we didn't evolve to eat meat, we evolved because we ate meat. This vast resource of ruminant animals were already present. They were already converting the rich grassland and plant material into high quality animal protein and most importantly, fat. So one interesting thing about a ruminant animal is if, if for example, in a beef cow, you or any beef animal, if you, tr if you get more fat in its diet than about 5%, you start to make that animal sick. It, it, the fat is toxic to the rumen microorganisms. Now, it's also interesting to me that polyunsaturated fats are even more toxic. Such so as? You can't, oh, the, the sorts of omega-3s and 6s that you would get from you know, certain seeds or um, um, byproducts. For example, if you had a meal that still had a significant amount of fat in it, you'd have to be very careful about how much of that you could feed to a ruminant animal. So what happens is the diet of a beef cow, for example, will be less than 5% crude fat, one measurement of it. But then one of the principal byproducts of the fermentation of fiber in the rumen are volatile fatty acids. Those volatile fatty acids, the cow absorbs through her rumen wall and then 70% or more of her total energy needs are met from those fats that are produced in fermentation. So one might think it's better to feed the carbohydrate to a ruminant that's gonna turn it into fat instead of us. <laughs> Just another way to look at it. Right, and so basically and in, the, in the addition, ruminants, okay, go ahead, Peter, yes, sir, I'm sorry. No, no, please. Well, I was going to say, so basically, come back to the ruminants can take cellulose material, just scrub grassland, which we cannot eat. And if we tried to till that land, we would wind up depleting the soil, having uh, topsoil erosion, and having basically a dust bowl situation like we had back uh, early in the, in the 1900s in the, in the Midwest. Or we could let the cows graze that land and they could literally turn that scrub cellulose, the scrub grass and the, and the tall grasses, they could turn that into fat and protein, which we then could, could eat, which, yes, would be their taste, which would be their tasty booty. Well, it, it, and, and let's remember that if we have really scrubby ground, what we're trying in that case to produce is a calf from the cow that's running on that land. Yeah. That calf then we're going to wean off mama in five or six months and ship that calf to some other environment. It may be the same ranch, but just irrigated pasture ground. It might be from Florida to the Midwest it could be, and, and animals get moved around quite a bit within the United States, but the idea is that growing calf has a higher nutrition demand 
than that native range might be able to produce. The best use of that native range would be to run a cow-calf operation and produce the calves. And mama, when she's at low maintenance requirement, can get by on very poor quality feed. And that's exactly what you were saying. So the, there is that, and again, I'm talking beef, but this is any ruminant animal. Uh, it's just beef is the one that most people are familiar with. So in, in addition to this upgrading of protein, the production of fat from fiber, Ruminant animals do produce all three forms of long chain essential uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, fish only produce two. Uh, we're still trying to figure out the importance of that difference. Um, you know, the omega-3 that comes from animal products is far more useful to us than the omega-3 that comes from plant products. The omega-6 that comes from ruminant animal products is, is of a different function than the omega-6 that comes from plant products. Um, also, we have minerals being made more absorbable by us than what comes from plants. Um, and we're getting rid of any anti-nutrient quality that the, or components that the plants have. They're producing new, uh, minerals, or sorry, vitamins that uh, we need. And so all of the, and then you can start to see um, a lot of benefits to the environment in which we practice proper grazing management. And, and the critical thing about grassland is it's tremendously important to watershed health. Um, again, it, it plays a role in carbon cycling, water cycling, nutrient cycling. And all of these roles are improved when we practice good management of grazing animals on those grasslands. So talk to us about cow farts, Peter, because I know that's a big deal and that's, that's ruining the, the ozone layer in the atmosphere. All the, are the, all the greenhouse gases that cow come from the back ends of cows, I know is a big deal. And, and I'm obviously being sarcastic, but I want you to explain to us, relatively speaking, the, the carbon footprint of the entire population of cattle or all ruminants in the U.S. versus industrial carbon footprints versus uh, transportation carbon footprints. Talk to us about that. And if you guys, if you're watching this, if anybody's worried about the environment, about the planet, is eating meat going to hurt the planet, please share this with them. Share it in your groups. You guys comment, hit the thumbs and hearts and, and help us reach as many people because so many people right now currently are afraid to eat meat. They're like, I love meat. When I eat meat, I feel good, but I feel guilty. I feel like I'm hurting the planet if I eat too much meat. And that's what we're talking about tonight is you can, you can put that guilt in the closet. You can lock it away because it's not helping the planet at all. So talk to us about cow farts, Peter. <laughs> Yeah, so first of all, it's not that end of the cow, it's, it's what comes out of its mouth, which is the principal source of methane that is the cause of concern. Um, and methane is one of the greenhouse gases, um, but as we go along and do actual research, we're finding that perhaps it's not as, as impactful as some would say, uh, and that's due to a number of reasons. Um, but again, if, if someone comes at you saying that, you know, cattle produce more greenhouse gas emissions than all of transportation combined, then just know that what they've quoted you is a flawed study quote that has since been retracted. The authors retracted it, admitted that they had done the analysis incorrectly. When you look at the United States, the greenhouse gas, the anthropogenic global greenhouse gas emissions from cattle are approximately 2% of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions for the United States, 2%. 
And do we have a, a an approximate percentage of the greenhouse gas effect of all the all of the farm vehicles that are used to cultivate arable land? Do we know a percentage like so for all the combines and tractors and trucks that a farmer would use and all the trucks that would haul the grain to and fro? Do we know a percentage of that? So we could basically say cow production produces this percentage of, of greenhouse gases and uh, you know, the, the grains produce this percentage of the greenhouse gases. Can we, do we know that number? I, I, th I think that the numbers go something like this, 2% <clears throat> for beef, 3.8% for all of ag animal agriculture, which would include that 2%. Okay. So yes, beef is a significant source of greenhouse gases from the animal agriculture. Okay. I think the total for agriculture is somewhere below seven, somewhere in that 7%. So you can, you know, subtract out. Okay, the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in cattle, oh, uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so 2%, 3.8%, we'll call it 7%. If you start looking at other industries, the healthcare industry is 10%. Transportation is something like 26%. Now, if, and that's the United States. And the problem, of course, is if you look worldwide, you have very different economies worldwide, right? And so you could have a relatively small number that looks like a large percent because overall you're not producing that much. That's one way that could happen. The other way it can happen is other countries don't have efficient production systems like we do. And so for those two reasons, if you look worldwide, I think it's something like 16% worldwide is, is coming from beef animals. Now, United States has about 10% of the world's cattle and produces 20% of the world's beef. So you begin to get a sense of how efficient we are and there's lots of reasons for that. But, you know, think about um, feeding a growing and growingly prosperous population worldwide. One way we could achieve that is to appropriately leverage technology and knowledge into these other countries, other regions, improve the productivity and efficiency of their ruminant animal agriculture and produce more beef from the same or fewer animals. One of the things that's happened in the United States since the 70s, and I think in the 70s, we peaked on the number of animals. And since that time, we've maintained beef production, but we've got somewhere around 25% fewer <clears throat> animals. So again, if you have fewer animals, you've got less of an environmental impact just from that, let alone anything else you can do in, in terms of size and in terms of reducing mortality and all of those other considerations. So you get a sense of how uh, complex these questions are, but when you can drill down into them, you see that you know, they have been overly, you know, uh, inappropriately simplified, just to be charitable. We've had a, um, a narrative that was part and parcel of the creation of the dietary guidelines. You can go right back to the, the, the dietary goals of America, I think that was the title, which was the Senate subcommittee report that came out of McGovern's committee and they cite as a reference in that document, Diet for a Small Planet, which was a vegetarian cookbook published in 1972, which was a follow on to what was published in the Population Bomb, which was you know, very much into the ethic of the environmental movement of that time. And, and so from its very beginning, part of this has been we have to eat plant-based diets because we can't feed the world if we continue to eat animal products. Well, I wanna push back and say, what if human beings have to eat animal products? Now we can argue about 
how much? Is it 100%? Is it 60%? Is it whatever? But there is no way. So, so here's my summary statement for ruminants. Modern humans exist because of ruminant animals. That modern societies depend upon ruminant animal agriculture, and we will not be able to meet the needs of 2050 when we're going to have 2 billion more human beings in the world and the population of humanity is going to be more prosperous. We can't do that without ruminant animal agriculture. And in fact, we have to... There, there's so many points here for us to tease apart, but what you said about guilt, I find it remarkable. And I really want us to fully onboard this idea. As you've said before, we each are responsible for our health, right? Unless we're a minor and then in case we have a you know parent and unless we have a elderly parent, in which case we might be in that role, whatever. But it's it's not the doctor's responsibility. It's not dietary guidelines responsibility. It's our individual responsibility. And, and when we improve our own health, we are in fact improving the world. Because we have no idea who's watching. We have no idea others have been on before the tipping point is reached. And then everyone says, right? I don't care what you're telling me. This is what I've experienced and what I'm going to go for. And then what I want people to know is to feel confident going to their local supermarket to buy whatever form of animal products is available, affordable, um, and appropriate to their background and life and, and feel confident in that. It's safe. It's it's nutritious. And if you <clears throat> eat that and don't eat these other things, you, the vast experience is that we, we have a, a abundant reason to expect that your health will improve, which means your life will improve, which means that your family will improve because of what's going on. And please don't listen to the voices that want you to feel guilty about eating more animal products because they're the same voices that got us to believe that a plant-based diet was what we should be eating to be healthy in the first place. Exactly. So of course they're going to tell you this, right? Uh, you know, it's just, it's, 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 people are entitled to make their own choices. Absolutely. But your personal beliefs should not be the basis for public policy. They should not drive research. They should not um, guide international development, which is also occurring right now. So on many, many levels, I want people to just feel more confident. Mm -hmm. You know, you, your purchase, you know, let's be serious here. Your purchasing decisions in the supermarket are not going to save or destroy the planet, right? Maybe Excellent. it's time for us to get a little... Maybe it's time for us to get a little humility here, right? We're just not that powerful, right? Everything we do is going to have an impact on the environment, obviously. Right. But why do we give some things a pass and other things not? You know, how, how can spending a billion dollars a day on overt diabetes care in the right. United States alone right. be considered sustainable? Exactly. And, and I was going to say, and, Peter, earlier you said that uh, two percent of the the greenhouse gases come from cattle production. What was it? Ten percent from healthcare? Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah. So you guys actually, you're not going to save the planet by not eating meat. What you're going to do is you're going to save the planet by eating keto and by eating a fatty meat heavy keto or a carnivore. Because what you're going to do is you're going to reduce your carbon footprint in the healthcare sphere because you're not going to be over utilizing health care because you're not going to be a type 2 diabetic. You're not going to be morbidly obese. You're not going to have 
chronically inflamed joints and having to go get x-rays and MRIs and joint injections and, and prescription medication after prescription medication, you're not going to have to do that because you're eating an ancestrally appropriate human diet, which is full of fatty red meat. That's what we've eaten for millennia on this planet. And only for the last 50, 60 years when we've been trying to eat this grain-based plant-heavy diet that we've been guilted into eating has the carbon footprint of healthcare exploded. And I would also say that the, the carbon footprint of transportation is much, much higher because you can't grow grain everywhere. But you can put a goat or a cow anywhere, just about, right? You can put a goat on, on land that can never be tilled, ever. And so, so by using, by eating ruminants, by eating sheep and cattle and goats, you can absolutely reduce your carbon footprint because you're not going to be sick and unhealthy and miserable and going to the doctor all the time and going to the hospital all, all the time. Okay, Peter, I'm done. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we're, we're, there's plenty of room on this soapbox. Um, the, the, let's, let's think about, you know, um, the medical waste that's produced from the dialysis industry, right? Um, let's think about, um, oh, here's one, food waste, okay? If you think about food waste, which is an enormous issue, right? We really need, you know, it, it, it's, if we would reduce our food waste, we would make a substantial impact on increasing the food availability that we're gonna to need to feed this growing population, right? So it doesn't just have to come from production, but if you look at food waste, and you compare meat, for example, to fish and shellfish, to vegetables, to fruit, to grain products, and you look at the waste from the production, you know, harvest or, or production through harvest, through distribution, through consumption in the home, the segment that has the lowest waste is meat. And so does that get factored in? Now, I'm learning, you know, about some of these areas that you get drawn into in the debate. Apparently, people who are doing life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas emissions currently don't consider respiration, right? So they have trouble with that, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk, and we'll see where we can go with that. But we should know that human beings who consume a fat-based, a fat diet, right, as opposed to a carbohydrate diet, there's this thing called respiratory quotient, RQ, right? And, and if you're eating mm -hmm. mostly carbohydrate or entirely carbohydrate, you're somewhere around a one. And if you're on a uh, fat only diet, you know, or you, all you're burning is fat, I'll get the words right, you're about a 0.7. So that difference means, and you could argue about how much, but what that means is human beings who are on fat primary energy fuel diets are emitting less CO2 themselves. Okay, so again, when they do the life cycle analysis, they don't consider that. They just sort of think, oh, okay, it's respiration. It's coming from the air. It's going back to the air, whatever. But I think that we need to understand that again, this is part of the carbon cycle and think about what seven and a half or nine and a half billion human beings, each emitting 20% less CO2 might mean if that were part of the calculation. So I, I think there's lots of ways to look at this. People have done some good work looking at organic carbon increases in soil under proper grazing management, and it becomes a significant number. Now, apparently that's not yet going into the you know, sustainability conversation at a certain level of research. Um, but I'll also point out that the industry itself, when I, the beef industry itself has a major sustainability initiative. They're doing work trying to look at, you know, different, you know, quantify the differences from New England, for example, to, you know, Eastern Colorado. Clearly different environments, clearly different systems, different impacts. They're doing that work and then they're saying, look, if, it, it, you know, we have to consider 
not just environmental factors when we talk about sustainability. We also have to talk about economic factors, right? We also have to consider societal factors. And so those three now are part of what they're looking at. And, and I'm asking, all right, who's informing your deliberations when it comes to health? Is, is, is the health consideration reaching back to the sort of conventional wisdom of what constitutes a healthy diet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Or how do we get maybe some of this newer sort of perspective to inform your consideration and therefore shift maybe the conversation about what is sustainable? If the chronic disease epidemic that we're currently experiencing is the result of hyperinsulinemia, which I think it in large part is, and I'm, I'm sure that we haven't fully onboarded that um, outside of this community, but if that's the case, then, and a diet high in animal products, is the first course of action in trying to address that condition. How do you then factor that into the conversation about sustainability, let alone these other sort of, you know, conversations about only four less than 4% of the earth's surface, dry surface, no, actually surface, less than 4% of the earth's surface is suitable for cultivation. Meanwhile, something around 15% is rangeland and another 10% is forest land. And we can in fact practice some form of ruminant animal agriculture on what amounts to about a quarter of the earth's surface versus 4%. Excellent. Oh, and Excellent. by the way, go ahead. By, by the way, we are rapidly losing that less than four percent because that's where we like to build cities. Yes, that's that's where we like to you know develop, and so we're losing you know <clears> one <throat> plant a subdivision that ain't coming back into agriculture. Right. Talk to us for a minute, Peter, about what happens to 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 an acre of land that I have my cattle grazing on versus an acre of land that I'm growing soybean on. Talk to us about which soil is built up, which soil is depleted, where do we have the most uh, soil erosion, uh, and that sort of thing. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that this is going to vary based on location, right? Lots is going to change. But as a rule, anytime we till the soil, we are losing organic matter. Anytime we till the soil, we are making that soil more susceptible to water erosion and wind erosion. Okay, now there's lots of practices people are implementing to lower that, but that's still the reality. Okay, if we're grazing perennial pasture, those are plants that are going to live for more than one year. So in other words, think of, think of your lawn, okay? You have this sod that covers the soil, protects the soil, a lot of root masses in the soil because plants that are perennial in nature rather than annual in nature make a lot more root mass than annuals, okay? And so a lot more of the uh, photosynthesis is the conversion of CO2 and water into carbohydrate. And then that carbohydrate is used to build plant tissue, roughly speaking. And then that plant tissue can either be above ground or below ground. When you look at pasture, you're looking at about half of the total plant. In other words, about half uh, you know, is below the ground and a half is above the ground. And so that's a very different situation than we have when we have annual crops. Now, the annual crops have been selected and been developed to be very productive. 
And so we might, you know, be able to actually produce more harvestable yield per acre from these arable crops than we could from pasture. But that's only one aspect to look at. Gotcha, gotcha. Now let's shift away, Peter. Let's talk about, because, you know, you've, you've probably heard me say that a lot of the people who, who follow me on Facebook and watch my YouTube videos and, and indeed my patients at the Berry Clinic cannot afford grass-fed, grass-finished, panda-massaged beef that's raised in the mountain, the Himalayan mountains, right? They can't afford that. They can't afford $20 a pound beef. And so I tell them, hey, you can do keto with hot dogs and mustard. You can buy the, the cheapest, fattiest ground beef at, at China Mart, and it's going to be way the hell better for you than the family-sized bag of Doritos. Talk to us and help us understand why it's not such a big deal to get grass-fed, grass-finished, and what, what those terms actually mean and what they ultimately mean as far as our omega-3, omega-6 that we get from the beef and all that stuff that we hear talked about in the keto, paleo, primal sphere. Sure. I, I think that it, what I said before, buy what you can afford, what's available, what you like to eat, what is appropriate to your family and your background. Um, so the fact that I eat a lot of beef shouldn't be taken as that's all you should eat, right? Um, you know, we have lots of animal products available to us in the United States for relatively small amounts of our disposable income. Um, or even our total income. Uh, I may be wrong on that. Uh, disposable income, uh, what remains after you've met certain necessities, and I would consider food a necessity. So um, relatively low cost. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I think that people should understand that if they like the taste um, of grass-fed beef or grass finished beef, which I think is the, uh, the term that would indicate that <clears throat> this animal has never had anything but grass, <clears throat> then by all means eat that. Um, you know, not, and, and the concern that I would have is that the uh, producer is getting paid enough to receive a profitable wage for his efforts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, on the other hand, I'm very suspect of a lot of the health claims that have been made for one form of beef over another. And I strongly suspect that what has happened is we've gotten things conflated. Um, so, you know, just to take an example, we had the all these paradoxes come up, right? Our, our original theory is that fat in the diet causes heart disease, right? And right. okay, but now, now we find these people in the Mediterranean that actually eat a lot of fat and they don't have heart disease. Oh, it must be the olive oil. Okay. Then we have the French who also eat a lot of fat more than us. They even smoke more than we do but they have less heart disease. It must be the antioxidants in the red. What We have the French paradox. We right. even had the Swiss paradox because, you know, and we think that it must be the, 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 the antioxidants in the dark chocolate. Notice that each time this happens, there's an industry that benefits from this. But what it really means is we can't let go of the hypothesis that fat in the diet causes heart disease. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe this is all signs that that's wrong, but we can't go there, can we? So now we come up, we have the Greenland paradox, as I call it. We find a group of people that have very little heart disease despite eating a diet high in fat. Okay. And what's funny now to me is that this was assumed to be fish oil. And again, we had a fish oil industry that benefited massively. 
But as it turns out, fish wasn't even the primary source of fat in their diet. <laughs> it was coming from marine mammals. And mammals produce three kinds of long chain omega-3 fatty acids, not just the two that the fish do. And maybe that would explain why we've had a hard time proving that fish oil supplements had a, any significant impact on, you know, so it's, it's been a mixed story. Let's leave it there in terms of trying to trace out. But again, we, we have this, this narrative and then we have the paradox. So I am, not, I am very suspicious. You go back far enough in the literature when grass finished, started becoming a thing in the literature, you actually see them trying to tout lower cholesterol levels, lower saturated fat levels. There's lots of mentions about how this is associated with heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So very suspicious about that. And then when you look at ratios, you find that that story is not as clear as people want it to believe. The, the ratios in grass-finished beef varies based on breed, based on sex, based on feeding, based on season, based on the muscle it's taken from. It's, it's a tremendously variable quantity and or metric and there's absolutely no information to help a consumer make a choice in the marketplace. So it's, it's a pretty <clears throat> worthless from that point of view. And then if you really want to dig in and find out what the quantities are, what you find is that ruminant flesh, regardless of how it's finished, is always going to be less impacted by diet than the flesh of monogastrics like swine or fish or poultry. And beef, regardless of how it's finished, is not a rich source, quote unquote, of either omega-6 or omega-3. So for all those reasons, I, I, I'd really like people to kind of slow their roll on the health claims. Um, and then there's other issues with meat that people could talk about, be concerned about. And again, it's one of these things where we could tease it apart and try to talk about it. But um, I get back to the point of somebody who's realizing that, you know, I've got prediabetes. I really like to not have diabetes or I do have diabetes and I would like to, you know, achieve better health. Go to the supermarket you know, as you said, buy the 80-20 hamburger, learn how to cook meat because we've forgotten how to do that. Um, buy what's affordable. You know, um, the, the story that really resonates with me is the one that Dr. Ted Naiman tells about a patient who came to him who, uh, you know, the man's living in a tent. Um, he is, he goes to the secondhand store, he buys a uh, uh, a used uh, cast iron skillet he cooks on a butane stove. He buys the 80-20 hamburger on sale at Safeway because that's our big chain here in the Northwest. Um, he buys eggs, you know, the, the, the store brand that are, you know, loss leader eggs. That's what he eats. It costs him like $6 a day for food and fuel. And in a year, I don't know what the time frame was, but it was relatively short. He dumped 70 pounds of weight and normalized all his, you know, blood panels. So now let's have a conversation about why that man should have been spending more to improve his health. Because it seemed like he did exactly. a pretty good job on some yeah. pretty, you know, and, and if somebody really wants to make an impact in the world, then one approach might be to figure out what the difference in cost is going to be between what he could buy from Safeway, what some higher brand, you know, product would be, save that difference for a year, and at the end of the year, write a check to something like the Noakes Foundation or some other worthy phil philanthropic organization that's trying to do something to improve the health and living conditions of some of our brothers and sisters somewhere in the world. 
I think we need to be very focused on improving the flourishing of our fellow human beings around the world. Starts at home, obviously, and there's lots of work to do here, goodness knows. But having been to Brazil within the last couple months, you know, um, and, and having just watched an interview, um, there are still too many people that think people become obese because they don't exercise, right? And it's hard for me to, listen, um, in Brazil 45 years ago, they had the fourth largest population of underweight men, poverty, okay? Today, their rate of obesity and overweight is very similar to the U.S., 45 years difference. You know, one out of three children is overweight. One out of three women is obese. You know, when, when I was young, you know, <laughs> um, the concern was famine. You know, not enough calories, people starving to death. Today in the world, it's like 800 million human beings are still in that condition. And yeah, that's a shame. That's a scandal. We should do better and we can. But 2.2 billion human beings in the world today are now overweight or obese. Now, what everyone needs to understand is both of those conditions are a form of malnutrition. Yes. So out of seven and a half billion people in the world today, three million are suffering from malnutrition. And we've got to get people to understand that, that reality and then understand what an appropriate approach would be to remedying that. And, and it's not just agriculture, right? I mean, it's politics, it's law, it's... It's societal, it's every kind of dimension. But if people don't understand that as a goal, then there won't be the effort to achieve it. And meanwhile, we've got very wealthy, affluent people who mean well, I'm convinced, they've been indoctrinated into what I think is a misinformed belief system. And they think the solution is to create some faux meat, some lab grown product, that that somehow is going to address these problems. And it's everything that I'm sharing is not controversial from a literature point of view, from a discipline point of view, if you go into these various areas and reach into their textbooks, you can find this stuff. It's just when you have so few people involved in agriculture, then you've got these other areas that now, the, the, the people fill that void of information with their belief system, with their rhetoric, with their propaganda. And and I think that there are people who want to do well and do good for other people. And somehow we need to do a better job of getting this information in front of them so that they can then put the pieces together and then figure out, oh, okay, this is something that could have a real impact. So product, uh, programs like Heifer International is one that does great stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a, um, I came across a study where the only intervention, the one, the one thing that they did was they gave women one egg a day, one chicken egg a day. And they did that through pregnancy. Can't remember right now whether they did it before pregnancy or just through the, the, the pregnancy and then through nursing. And the children of those mothers ended up with larger brains. Yeah. Well, if we're going to solve the problems that are going to face us, you know, at the end of this century, which we can't even imagine at this point, it's going to take a lot of well-nourished brains communicating with each other and, and, and solving these problems. 
Um, the, the, there's an example of that, the great horse manure crisis of 1894. Um, yeah, look, a squirrel. Um, what happened in the cities prior to in, in, internal combustion engines was horses were the principal means of, commun of, of, of transportation. And cities were not pleasant as a result. There were massive amounts of dung and urine deposited every day. There were dead animals, there were accidents, there was abuse. It was just not good. 25% of our farmland had to be dedicated to growing fuel for the horses. And so these things were a problem in 1894, I think it was, there was this assembly of, you know, planners. It was one of the first city planner meetings that took place. And these experts came from Europe and England and, and the United States. They met in, in New York now, before the turn of the 20th century, that significant travel, they got there. They were supposed to spend 10 days coming up with a solution. And they all quit after three because they couldn't imagine a solution, right? They just, it's, there's no solution to this. In, in, in 30 years, we're gonna have horse manure to the second story windows in New York City and you know, whatever. And then we had the in, internal combustion engine. They couldn't imagine technology that they hadn't seen yet. And they ha couldn't see the impact that that would have. And, and <clears throat> You know, news isn't about what's working. News is about what's broken. And so we, we have an entire industry that is looking for bad news to tell. Meanwhile, there's really good news available. And, you know, we, we seem to love, you know, bad news. So there's a whole genre of books written by what I call catastrophists. And that's their whole shtick, right, is just to, to oh, you know, the, the sky is falling and what have you. And they're wrong every time, yet they guide so much in the world. And, yeah. and I think yeah. that people, mm -hmm. as you're telling people about how they can avoid the, you know, avoid being one of the 200 people a day in the United States that's going to lose some part of their body due to the standard of care of diabetes, or every 30 seconds, someone in the world loses a lower limb due to diabetes, right? As you tell human beings, there's a way you, you don't have to do that. There, there's a, there's a, you know, sort of like opening a door in the hallway. You could go out here. You don't have to go to the end. You could go out here. Um, it's important for them to accept and, and believe that that actually is the best thing for every level, societally, economically, and environmentally. Yes, yes, I love it. As we wrap up, Peter, give us a few just uh, uh, bullet points that we can take away from this conversation with regards to how can we best eat to uh, not hurt the planet, grass-fed versus grass-finished versus, you know, uh, feedlot finished these sorts of things, give us some bullet points that we can actually use tomorrow when we, when we wake up and we can say, you know what, I'm going to do this because Dr. Peter Ballerstadt said this. Uh, I, I just go right back to if, if this is what's best for your health, it is what's best. Yes. Don't listen I to the, I voices. love it. That's beautiful. So when you improve your lot, your health, you are, in fact, improving the planet. Yes, that's beautiful. You guys write that down. That's it. That's quotable. When you improve your health, you are improving the planet. I love it. I love it. Let's not even, let's just stop right there. That's the most beautiful thing I've heard all day. Dr. Peter Ballerstadt, tell us how we can find you on social media if we can't get enough of you and we want more. How can we find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook by name or my page is Grass-Based Health. Um, you can also find me um, on Twitter. Uh, that handle is at Grass-Based, one word. I'm also on Instagram at the same name. 
And on YouTube, I have a channel. Just look for my name again, Peter Ballerstead. Um, if you have if you have specific questions, I'm available by email. You can write me at peter dot at gmail dot com. Gorgeous, Doctor Peter Ballerstead. Thank you so very much for spending some time with us this evening. It's an absolute pleasure to chat with you again. Hopefully, we'll get to meet up again in our travels soon one day, and uh, and uh, have some good conversation over some good beef. That sounds very good to me. Thank you. I look forward right. to it. Talk to you next time, Peter. Thank you, guys.